you should get a pop-up there that says that we're recording. Okay. All right. If we could all mute, I'd appreciate it. Um, just helps you should get a pop-up there that says that we're recording. Wait. Now I get a feedback okay. on what I just said. Hold on. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that me making that? No, the feedback, no, it's not me. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome to our uh, meeting of the Special Commission, Legislative Commission to study and examine the civil service laws. And today is our public meeting session. We've opened up invitations to members of the public who want to uh, attend and speak to our commission. Uh, my name is Kenneth Gordon. I'm the House Chair on the I'm the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Safety, co-chair of this commission. I'm happy to be alongside my colleague, Senate Co-Chair Mike Brady, who is co-chair of me on both of these assignments. Senator Brady, Chair Brady, do you want to share some remarks? You're still muted, Senator. Okay. I tell you what, do you want me to do the roll call and then come back to you, Senator? Yeah, okay, all right. So we'll do the roll call so that, um, especially members of the public know who's here. Uh, we have Marcella King, Department of Corrections. Good morning, President. Thank you. Uh, Mike Papani. I'm here, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Tom Reddy, Police Union. I'm present. Thank Good you. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sophia Hall from the ACLU. Sophia Hall, I don't think I saw you on here yet. If, you, if you're if you here, we'll just add you to the attendance. Neil Osborne. Good morning, everyone. Neil Osborne's here representing the New England Area Conference of the NAACP. Welcome. Uh, Larry Calderon from Mass Law Enforcement Policy Group said he could not attend today. Uh, Chris Del Monte, Police Chiefs. Good morning, President, sir. Good morning. James Rona, Fire Chiefs. Uh, President, good morning. Good morning. Jeffrey Lopes, Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers. Okay. Steve Gabriel, State Police. Good morning, sir. President. Good morning. Rob Quinnen, Civil Service Commission. Good morning, President. Good morning. Eric Estepenis, Office of Public Secretary of Public Safety. Good morning, President. Good morning, Ron Mano, um, Office of ANF. Hi, Mr. Chair, President, sir. Attorney Richard Sweeney from the Mass Bar Association. Good morning, everyone, President. Good morning. Tom Lyons from the Veteran Services Agents Association. Oh, I see you. You're coming in. Tom Lyons is in the waiting room coming in, so he, he's present. He probably can't connect immediately, but he's here. Uh, Secretary uh, Cheryl Poppy, Veteran Services. Hi, good morning, Everett, Mr. Chair, and everyone else present. Good morning. Jesse Flynn, Disabled American Veterans. Present, thank you. Right here. Okay. Jen Breaker, Mass Municipal Association. Present, good morning. Good morning. Right. Kim Parr uh, contacted us. He can't make it today. All right, China Tyler, are you here? Yes, good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Rep. Maria Robinson. Um, you maybe, is Rep. Robinson, is she headed for the federal government already? She might be, so she's not here. Uh, Rep. Uh, Vice Chair Natalie Higgins, I saw you here. Good morning. Good morning, Rep. Pat Patricia Haddad, I think I saw you here. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Rep. Whalen, did I see you here? I think I did. President, sir, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Senator Moore, I saw you too. Um, yep, I'm here, thank you. Senator Kennedy. I'm present, Mr. Chair, good morning. Thank you. And is, uh, I don't think Senator Tarr is here, but is Hirak here? Oh, I see Hirak, he's in the waiting room. So Hirak Shah is here representing Senator Tarr. And, and if um, Cody or someone from the staff, can you message the folks that were in the waiting room that we we um, responded for because I see their names, Iraq and 
I know there were a couple others that, that I said, I saw. Okay, so Senator um, Brady, are you? Yeah, I'm back and I had lost, okay. I had lost the video screen, but I'm back on. So thank you for introducing everybody and welcome everyone today uh, for coming on this meeting. Okay, um, let's, uh, we've sent everyone the minutes from our meeting on December 3rd. And you should, you should receive that copy if you've read that and are prepared. I entertain a motion to accept the minutes. Second motion. Uh, second. Second. All those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, so that motion passes unanimously. Um, we're going to move on to the substantive part of our meeting now, which is presentations from members of the public. Uh, we've had 31 people signed up, and let me go to that list. Um, it turns out that I think almost everyone who signed up to testify is involved in some way with the PFFM or, the, or otherwise the firefighters. And so what I'm going to do is ask a few folks that I'm not sure if you're um, here affiliated with, if you're a firefighter or affiliated that way, um, and, I, and I'll take you first because it because you're going to speak on a different um, aspect of civil service, if in fact that's the case. So Nick Padalero, are you a firefighter or involved with PFFM? Are you here? Nick Padalero, yeah, yeah, Padalero. Okay, uh, Paul Joseph, before you speak, I just want to ask you that if you're here um, involved with the firefighters. Paul Joseph? Okay, and the third name, and I think you are here, I saw you, is Francisco Maldonado. Uh, yes, I'm not involved with the uh, fire department. I'm a police officer for the city of Lowell. Okay, so why don't you start us off? So our, on, we're, we're going to use our committee rules, which is people are limited to three minutes. If, at this point, if you go a little bit over, that's fine. But uh, we're interested to hear your testimony on our civil service laws. Well, I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Francisco Maldonado. I've been a police officer for the city of Lowell for the last 25 years. I have benefit from the uh, civil service on laws. I originally didn't think of being a police officer when I was uh, young. In 1996, I had taken the test with some friends. On, actually, it was 1992. It's a long time ago. And we took some tests because of the economy. And we also joined the military at the same time. And due to civil service, we were lucky that our names were taken off the, uh, act, uh, on the active hiring list. And then we joined the service. We did our four years, we came back and we still had the opportunity for our jobs. And that's how in 96, I was hired. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for being here and being able to speak. The issue that I like to bring into light is there is, there is some circumventing of civil service on laws by, by management that's affecting on promotional list. On one particular, which I've, on, I'm involved with right now, is the ability of uh, a manager to, or a chief to uh, cancel the civil service after looking at who's on the list after two years and having some past practice of extending the list. In low, we've had that list extended for three years for over 10 years. And presently, and presently, um, presently, presently. Can everybody else please mute? Please mute if you're not speaking. So, so pre presently, this list is, is trying to be terminated on and the past practice ended. On, um, I just think that civil service should uh, make it mandatory that the list duration of time should be announced on prior to the test being given so that we know when the test ends officially. And if there's going to be an extension, that should probably be towed ahead of time. I think it's a uh, disadvantage or you know, an advantage if you're in management to be able to look at the list, look at the candidates and decide whether you want to extend it or terminate the list after you've seen who's on the list. Presently, our list is composed of a lot of minorities and we're gonna be affected by 
this uh, list if it's terminated. I don't think it will be. I think on uh, past practice on uh, in the challenge to a gre the grievance process might on uh, win that. The other thing, and because of time, that I've also uh, also think needs to be looked at is on uh, having some disconnect of management from on uh, the process of on uh, the assessment on uh, process hiring and a, a firm to do an assessment test. I think it on. Uh, it needs to be something where management doesn't have control of the company they hire or which questions are asked. I think they have the opportunity to disclose some of this information to their favorites and given an advantage to those that have taken the test. I'm not sure where the clock stands right now. So with, you know, I think I touched the things I wanted to touch on. Um, if you have any questions, I, you know, this is all new to me. I've never been involved, uh, but I'm getting close to retiring, and I think I might want to be involved in politics now. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what to say. Maybe not, right? <laughs> but, um, thank you very much for taking the time to come and join us and share your your experience. Um, I understand um, and, and your suggestion about um, having some notice about how the lists are being, um, when they're being maintained, when they're gonna be terminated so that labor has the opportunity to do that. Do, do you, what's your experience with that? Do you feel that you've been treated well? Uh, uh, fairly, I should say. I, I don't feel I've been treated fairly because the fact that you, we had a portion of the list promotions made off that list. And then the other second half, uh, because of the uh, option they have, on uh, they can terminate the list if they don't like who's on that list or if they have favorites or or someone that isn't a favorite you know what i mean i think in full disclosure i think that that option should be determined at the beginning of the test you know if they if they want a three-year list they say hey our list is going to be three years if it's two years this list will end two years this should be no option to look at into Pandora's box and then decide that you want to close it up. After the fact, essentially. <laughs> I get that. Uh, okay, anybody else, any commissioners have any questions? Chair um, Brady, do you have any questions? Thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair and Officer Maldonado. Thank you for your frankness on your concerns regarding the list and all that. Um, we appreciate your openness. Um, on a lighter note, I saw the goalie stick behind you. Are you a goaltender in your part time? I, I no. would recommend, because I was going to say, I'd recommend you stick to hockey. And, and politics is a more of a blood sport than hockey sometimes. So just to give you the heads up. Uh, I think I might, I might take your advice. Thank you very much. All right. It's not bad prep, though. It's not bad preparation. Um, anybody else with questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I'd that just is. like to thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Officer Maldonado is from Lowell and so am I, and I would just like to thank him for testifying today. And um, and also I know that he spoke to someone from my office on Tuesday evening, uh, shortly after the city council meeting, I believe. So um, so anyways, thanks, thanks for doing that, Officer Maldonado. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I don't hear any more questions. So thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. And that's gonna leave us with the list of the folks that are testifying as firefighters, uh, including those um, uh, affiliated with PFFM. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rich McKinnon before I do just procedurally. What, what I'd ask is that as you're listening to testimony before you, um, and also to Francisco, if you're still here, we are accepting written testimony from the public right up until the end of February, because we're gonna provide our report at the end of March. So we'll still have time to use it. And it's important to have written testimony because when we're drafting our report, if we have something uh, firsthand, um, a firsthand document just to quote from or to look from, it's really just as important as uh, verbal testimony. So it, if you're testifying and have something prepared, you can share that with us. Or if you feel that others have made the point that you were gonna make ahead of you, um, the fact that you're all here is important 
And so you don't have to feel compelled to repeat testimony you've heard, but you can certainly um, send us any remarks that you otherwise would have made if you feel that way. Uh, so Rich McKinnon from PFFM, you're here. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? I can, we can. All right. Thank you. Uh, for those on in, in the meeting, my name is Rich McKinnon. I'm the president of the Professional Firefighters of Massachusetts, representing the over 12,000 firefighters across the Commonwealth. I wanna thank this commission for their hard work regarding civil service, especially our representative that sits on the commission, Mike Papani. I've listened to many of the meetings uh, over the past couple months, and we strongly agree with the commission the vital need to strengthen civil service. It starts with properly funding and staffing the, de the department. We advocate every day with our firefighters for adequate staffing levels and the right equipment to work with. We need the same for civil service. <laughs> they are our support system <laughs> in much needed staffing and for much needed staffing and promotions. They are a very important partner with us in public safety. This commission was established to study how we can make our public safety departments more diverse, and we welcome those conversations. It has been proven in previous testimony to this commission that the municipalities that left civil service to make their departments diverse have not done so. There's proven testimony. And we need to hold those departments and municipalities accountable. The MMA wants to make it easier to exit civil service with no accountability, follow up or data on diversity. They have playbooks on how to exit and how to bypass workers. They teach classes on it. We need to do the opposite. We need to make it more accountable to the process of leaving and exit civil service. I represent locals that have left civil service and every single one of them have had serious problems regarding hiring, promotions, nepotism, fines, and ever increasing expenses. Wellesley, where a fine was recently issued to a fire chief for nepotism. Just this past Friday, we heard of lawsuits in Swampscott where the city is blatantly disregarding the exit, exit language regarding civil service. I get those phone calls. We get involved in those lawsuits. It's a big expense, not only for the cities, but for the firefighters that have to take these lawsuits on that don't have civil service protection. We need the process and oversight of civil service. And many of these locals that have gotten out wanna get back in. You will hear today from many of my own members, both in civil service and those out of civil service. The overwhelming fact will be that those departments that remain in civil service are more diverse and more protected. I urge all my members on this call to please submit written testimony, as the chairman said, prior to the, the end of February. I thank you for this opportunity to testify today. You can obviously see how important civil service is to our membership by the list of members um, that have taken their own time today to testify. Again, I wanna thank the full commission and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. In, and. Um, because of the number of members that you have with you, do you want to present, um, you know, we, other than, rather than the three minute segments that we usually would do, do you want to call out some members that you may have, you may expect to have some substantive testimony to bring out before other members? I mean, it's up to you, so. I, I, absolutely, I have other I members that, that are in our headquarters. I, I don't want to, through the chair, I don't know if there's certain questions. I see people yeah. with their hand raised. Yep, let's do questions go. too, and then you can MC. We'll turn it to you to call on who you want. Uh, uh -huh. Rep Whalen, you or I'm sorry, I'll call the questions and then you call the members. So Rep Whalen, I see you up there first. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll do my best to be brief. Um, just in my uh what's going on now, eight years on this uh, joint committee on public service, uh 
that have seen we, we've had numerous bills it's come through and as, as, as you well know mr chairman a uh, number of bills have come through our committee we voted on in the house to remove uh, departments from civil service and uh, countless times myself, Representative DeCoste, other longtime members of the committee, <clears throat> have asked uh, fire chiefs and police chiefs as to their plan going forward to ensure diversity and uh, veterans hiring in accordance with um, civil service requirements. Those commitments that we get from those uh, chiefs typically uh, expire. I mean, they're, they're not enforceable to begin with, but they do typically expire, uh, certainly when that, uh, when that chief retires. And they can basically set their own rules. So that's what I'm offering. Uh, yeah. If everybody can be on, on mute, I don't know if that's feedback, but Rep, we don't, we can't hear you. And for the last 15 seconds, you just started on the bad part. I'll just close out. Uh, uh, I, I support everything that uh, President McKinnon offered uh, in his testimony. Uh, and again, I'm basing that on my eight years of service on this committee and uh, what I've uh, public service committee and what I've seen in um, past presentations from other departments trying to lead uh, civil service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that there was some micro, but we heard almost everything that you said. The first 80 percent we were good with. Of course, that's probably too loud. <laughs> Secretary Poppy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, President McKinnon. I just, I just wanted to make sure that I, I caught something clearly that that you had said, um, so that I make sure I, you know, that I, that I interpreted it properly. You said uh, something to the effect of there are classes taught how to get around the civil service. That did I get that right? A absolutely. We have uh, playbooks, if you will, from MMA that teach or direct municipalities and appointing authorities on how to exit civil service. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming and giving us your candid testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. If, if you have one of those playbooks and, and want to share that with the commission, we'd, we'd like to we have, we have a full civil service uh, committee within the PFFM. Um, that we fight back when a local does not want to come out of civil service uh, and we partner with them and we definitely have that information. Okay. Um, I'm curious, I mean, you, you've got it. So does, is this something that, that instructs a, a, a municipality if you want to, then this is the, these are the steps to take or does it actually encourage them to leave civil service? I believe it's, it's the steps to take on how you exit civil service and some of the other past uh, cities and towns that have been successful in exiting civil service. Okay, uh, Mike Papani. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Mike. I know Rob, you had your hand up, but I saw Mike first, I'm sorry. Very quickly, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I think President McKinnon gives us a, a great opportunity. You mentioned the purpose of this uh, commission uh, to look at fairness and opportunity um, and diversity within the system. And you mentioned that you deal with this across the Commonwealth with uh, communities of all different sizes. In your opinion, do you think civil service, uh, as you said, that needs to be strengthened, but as it exists is a scalable uh, system and department that can uh, provide these um, services regardless of the size of the community? you know, from, from small towns to larger municipalities. In, in your experience, do you think this is a system that can work for everybody? I absolutely believe that this system works for everyone. I'm a, I'm a product of it. I work in a department, uh, an actually smaller department that is civil service. And we've seen our share of uh, issues regarding promotions and hiring and we thank God we have civil service that's there for, for, to protect us because quite honestly, we, I'm from just pers my own personal experience. We're from a f smaller group. We don't have the, sometimes the expenses and finances that a municipality has to take on some of these fights. So we have to rely on, on civil service uh, for those protections and that process that, that they carry out. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, that's all I had. I'm sorry, Rob Quinnen. Good, thank you. And, and I, I thank you for this testimony. 
Um, I think many of the commissioners would welcome um, specific suggestions about what types of accountability measures might be uh, introduced. So, um, uh, you know, perhaps the PFFM could uh, take this opportunity over the next couple of weeks to um, get specific about um, accountability measures um, that ought to be applied and whether that would be across the board uh, to all communities of a certain size in Massachusetts, um, or would it apply to uh, communities that have recently left a uh, civil service system, um, or would it be prospective only? I, I would absolutely welcome that opportunity and, and submit some ideas, absolutely. Yeah, I think we would all welcome that participation. Thank you for pointing for, for that request. Did you have more, Rob? No, that's it, thank you. Okay, Jesse Flynn. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, President McKinney, can you speak on the effect that revoking civil service has had on uh, veteran hiring in those municipalities that have revoked Chapter 31? Um, we've heard testimony from municipalities and departments that revoke civil service, and many of them reported um, a drop in veteran hiring. And then one, one other question is, um, do you feel that each of the 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth having 351 individual hiring processes would improve fairness um, in hiring public safety um, personnel? Thank you. Thank you, I'll, I'll take your first question. We, we have data and, and we work closely, many of our members are veterans, so we work uh, very closely on veterans issues. Um, and we actually have data that the cities and towns that have uh, exited civil service, their veteran population and hires have gone down drastically uh, in most cases. Uh, so we also have that data uh, and I believe you serving uh, the veterans may have some of that uh, data as well, because uh, a lot of times our issues correspond with each other. Um, but we definitely have that. So that's a definite um, kind of um, knock to, to veterans, quite honestly, that that when a community pulls out of civil service, uh, that veterans preference often just goes away. Um, the other issue as far as the communities that aren't in civil service, um, I absolutely believe that we should uh, create a standard that applies to all 351 uh, municipalities in, in, in the state. Um, if we're going to do this right, um, you know, I, again, not, I, I respect local option and kind of local uh, policies, but there should be a set of template standards, if you will, that every community has to follow. Um, and obviously the communities that are in civil service, th that applies. Um, but why should someone in a neighboring community to a civil service community um, basically have the wherewithal uh, to do whatever they want? Okay. Jesse, that's, that was your question. You're, you're set? Yes, thank you, President McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Okay. okay. Anyone else from the commission? Okay, President McKinnon, if you want, do, do you uh, yep. do you want to call Paul Jakes or do you? Will you tell uh, I'm me actually going to turn it over to Secretary Treasurer Cabral from the New Mr. Bedford Chairman. Department. We have somebody else with a hand raised up. Oh, I'm sorry, Chief Del Monte. I, I didn't see. Thank you very much, Senator Brady, Chair Brady. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to you, uh, President McKinnon. I appreciate your testimony here today and. And you guys are definitely well represented uh, with Mike on the commission as well. Just a question for you. Through the years, we've heard a lot, <clears throat> and I'm sure you've had your experience as well, where there could be improvements to the civil service system. Do you have, uh, or does the organization have recommendations on where those improvements can be made with the existing civil service uh, setup? Absolutely. Um, we work well with civil service as far as communicating some of our issues with them. And what we get, um, a lot of times, um, some of the complaints that we get from our own members is the timing. And when you have a promotional test, um, as far as how long it takes to get the marks back and the, the review process. Um, so that's one of the main um, issues that we get. And it's directly corresponded to the lack of staffing and funding at civil service. Um, I, I don't think it's a you know, uh, a big secret that if you look at 
where civil service was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago with regard to staffing, um, I think you'll see a depletion uh, of staff and no discredit to the staff that civil service has. Again, they communicate great with us with any of our issues, uh, but that would be our main, um, I guess, priority is to get it adequately staffed so it can function within the, the constraints of the law. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Right, Mr. Chairman? Oh, yes. Hi, thank you. Before we go on to Rich McKinnon, do you think we need legislation to pass to, to make sure that adequate staffing is provided? I'm all for, uh, I'm all for passing legislation to uh, you know, uh, maintain a staffing level, absolutely. You know, um, I know, I know it come and I sorry to interrupt you, but I know it also come back to making sure we have enough funding, of course, you know. Um, the other question I had, every community is different in size, like some of the larger communities, um, they're able to recruit women and minority probably better than than the smaller towns and in, in uh, very urban communities, uh, you know, rural communities, I should say. Um, and also the residency issues, some communities have residency, some do not. Uh, that's based on collective bargaining, usually, and what the bargaining goes forth. But also, you know, being in the fire department, you you have a ratio of how many miles you can live within a community where you have to work. So any recommendations on that you would think that we should be moving forward with? Yes, and, and I realize uh, the um, departments that are in civil service have the ability to bargain the residency law uh, or mile requirement, and, and many have. Um, I would urge and argue that you, we need to expand the residency mileage so we can uh, open up that pool of candidates. Um, you know, if you are in a, an affluent area um, where people really, can't, firefighters, quite frankly, can't afford to live in some of the cities that they work in, some of the cities and towns that they work in. So we do need to expand um, that residency requirement, I would urge, uh, you know, it to be done at the bargaining table, obviously, that's one of the benefits that we have being in civil service versus non civil service, they have to live within the legislation um, and the law that that is on, on the books. But residency is, is a big issue in, in every community. Again, to your that smaller community that has a very limited pool of candidates, we need to, because of the residency, we need to expand that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Rich, it's, it's over to yeah, you. I would turn it over. Is it, no other questions, Mr. Chairman? No other questions. All right. I'm always around. If anyone, anything comes mm -hmm. up, I'll uh, come back anytime. I'll turn it over to my Secretary Treasurer, Billy Cabral. Good morning, Chair Gordon. Chair Brady, members of the legislature and uh, members of this commission, I'd like to thank everybody for all the hard work you've done so far. Like Rich said, my name is Billy Cabral. I serve the Professional Firefighters of Massachusetts as a secretary treasurer. Civil service is one of the cornerstones of the fire service of Massachusetts. I believe that every, every municipality in the Commonwealth should be participating in it. For far too long, civil service has been underfunded. And now this commission has a great opportunity to fix the problem and fund civil service to the levels that it needs to flourish in the future. Due to, due to its lack of funding, both entry level testing as well as promotional testing prices have gone through the roof, making it difficult for, our men, for men and women to take the entry level and promotional exams. And I think that this stems from civil service being a revenue neutral body in the Commonwealth. And to keep themselves going, they're gonna to need to keep raising the revenues to actually participate, to actually have these, have these um, tests, have these tests funded, sorry. Residency should also be addressed through the fact that in some communities, the members of the fire service can't afford to live in the communities that they work in or surrounding cities and towns. A quick story, myself and uh, President McKinnon was speaking with a fire chief that was talking to us one day and was talking about how he wanted to get out of civil service. We asked him why. And the only reason why that he could give, it was, it's too easy, it's too hard to fire people. 
That was the sole reasoning behind getting out of civil service, which is wrong because civil service merely provides a process in that. And that's what we're all about, having a fair and equitable process. Civil service is the fairest system that the Commonwealth has to make sure patronage is taken out of the equation when it comes to hiring and promoting firefighters. It also gives due process to the members who are employed by civil service communities. It also encourages and gives preference to our military veterans who serve our country with, with bravery. There are glaring examples of municipalities that have gotten out of civil service and that their exit did nothing to address both minority and veterans hiring. Also patronage, only to have patronage taken over a fair and equitable system. Civil service has come out stating that they would like to have an entry, exam, entry level exam to be offered every year. And I strongly suggest that this commission make this a local option. This yearly exam may work for some communities but will become cumbersome to others. And speaking with our local leaders, there is not one that I have spoken to that has come out and said getting out of civil service was a good move. I'd like to thank this commission for their time and dedication to make civil service better and actually keep in check communities that have gotten out and encouraged them to come back into civil service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Brady, Chairman Gordon, and the members of the commission. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do have a question. Um, you mentioned um, your preference that a, an annual civil service exam be a local option. And I'll admit it took me a little bit of time to kind of understand the nature of your request, but just um, correct me if I'm wrong or tell me if this is accurate is the one reason you told me that I could understand is that for the large cities, the largest of cities that by the time they would get through the list for hiring, with an annual exam, it would be time for a new list. So it wouldn't give many people on that list a chance to interview and be hired because before the process went very far, there'd be a whole new list and they may be someplace else on the list. So they would be on a treadmill. They would always be trying to catch up uh, because I generally would like to protect labor at all costs and your, your labor. So um, <laughs> am I right? Is that why? Yes, that's one of the reasons, you know, for a smaller community where they have actually a smaller list, they might go through that list or even in a medium sized community, they might go through that list and they might need an, a, a subsequent list to be more than the two years or less than the two years that it is right now. But, um, you know, before a new list comes out three, I believe it's three months before a new list comes out, they actually prohibit municipalities from calling for that list, which makes the whole hiring process even more cumbersome. Like on the fire side of things, to actually get a person in the fire academy, you need a name and social security number. And that, that, once, that once that person's provisionally hired, it usually takes a good five, six months before they can actually get in the, in the fire academy. So having another three months added on to that, it really prohibits municipalities from actually, and prohibits fire departments from actually being able to staff the departments properly. That's why I think it's the local option should be, should be given. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the explanation. Any, uh, Senator Brady, any questions? I'm all set, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, I see a hand, Tom Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate uh, you know the firefighters uh, stepping forward as they have um, consistently throughout this um, commission, uh, particularly speaking on behalf of veterans. I represent the Mass Veteran Service Officers Association. Every city and town in the Commonwealth has a veteran service officer, uh, and and for many many years, um, and I think. Um, President McKinnon <laughs> said it correctly. For many, many years, we've been fighting MMA when it comes to a veteran's preference. Uh, sad to say, but unfortunately, uh, it's, a, it's a true statement. I guess my question for the, uh, the Treasurer is, um, does the State Association um, have a preference when it comes to the cadet program? I know um, some towns have created a fire 
a firefighters cadet program. The city of Boston has one, although it hasn't been implemented because they really don't have a plan. And for me, it seems like cities and towns are, are finding a way uh, to implement preferences um, to get around you know, veterans' preference. So I, I just want to see if the um, state firefighters uh, have a preference when it comes to the cadet program. Thank I, you for your time. I um, thank you for your question. I um, I actually think that the the cadet programs are local issues in particular, but I myself would like to take anything that brings patronage into a system. And I believe that sometimes those cadet programs, that's a way to get patronage into the system. You know, um, you know, the veterans that have served our country, they've done it, they've done it voluntarily and with dignity. And I think that when they come back, they should have some sort of preference. I'm not a veteran, but I'm grateful to those that are. And, uh, and that, that's how I feel. I hope that answers your question, Tom. You are correct when it comes to the patronage of uh, the cadet program. Uh, I, I saw that firsthand in Boston when they created the police program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Rich, it's up to it's over right, to you. Now we'll now we'll call on uh, our legislative agent Paul Jakes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, Chair Gordon, Chair Brady, members of the commission and staff. Thank you today for the opportunity to testify on the importance of civil service here in Massachusetts. For the record, my name is Paul Jakes, legislative agent for the professional firefighters in Massachusetts. And I'm also president for Attleboro Firefighters Local 848. Uh, as you've heard, we will be submitting written testimony, but wanted to speak briefly about the importance of civil service for our over 12,000 members across the Commonwealth. The fundamentals of civil service are here to help remove nepotism and politics from public safety, to allow for a fair and equitable merit-based hiring process, promotional process, and even termination. To put in place much needed protections that provide employees rights, progressive discipline, diversity, veteran protections, and to ensure the integrity of each is uphold without exception. Something that if left up to cities and towns uh, may not be followed to such a high standard. It's no secret that over time, there have been increased issues with civil service throughout its over 100 year existence. But make no mistake, these problems are not a result of civil service itself, but from the continued lack of funding year after year. Some may even say an intentional underfunding with a death by a thousand cuts. The lack of funding at civil service commission has created a backlog of cases and long delays in hiring processes that frustrate communities who rely on such a process. Because of this lack of proper funding, exam costs have been increased to become unaffordable for so many. Outdated residency requirements for those trying to get on the job and those currently on the job have not been addressed since its inception. Thankfully, there is residency legislation um, that made it a subject of collective bargaining during an FY14 sub budget. But there is currently pending legislation for non-civil service, both in the House and the Senate, to give this same bargaining right to non-civil service communities. Unfortunately, session after session, this legislation goes to study and we all know what that means. In a nutshell, like I said, we've submitted written testimony, but the message is let's fully fund and strengthen civil service and encourage everyone to stay in civil service. Doing so will maintain the integrity and the honor of our profession. But we just wanted to touch base on these things you've heard from President McKinnon, Secretary Treasurer Cabral, and others that will be on this Zoom today. We want to talk about the importance of civil service, give you an overview on what's really happening to help stop its implosion. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. And if there are any questions, I will turn it over to Mark Sanders from Boston Firefighters Local 718. Jesse, Lynn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, Paul. Um, I know that we have testified at dozens of, dozens of public service hearings uh, throughout the years opposing municipalities revoking civil service. And at those hearings, uh, municipalities tend to make many promises on diversification, veteran hiring, and other um, assurances in their new hiring system. In your experience, have those municipalities and departments kept those promises? No, you're right. Good to see you, Jesse. Uh, we have testified on numerous hearings on this uh, exact topic, and there has uh, it, most of the time they don't follow through with that. They tell you what you want to hear at the testimony, uh, but undermine the system itself. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chair Brady, do you have any questions? Okay. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just point out that we have been asking the, the question in public service this session of those municipalities that have left or those municipalities where one is in and one is out, that type of thing. And, and the, the, the information we've got is consistent with the testimony that we're hearing today. Um, it does not, we, we have, I believe we have yet to hear from a municipality that's increased diversity or increased the number of veterans they've hired after they've left. So uh, uh, Vice Chair Higgins is working uh, specifically on her subcommittee that's looking into that. And, and we are very interested in that topic here on this commission. Uh, anybody else with questions? And I think you said Mark, Paul said Mark Sanders is up, is up next for, to give testimony. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Senator Brady. Good, no good morning, Representative Gordon. Uh, I want to thank this commission for the hard work they've put into this. Um, my name is Mark Sanders. I'm one of the legislative agents for Boston Firefighters Local 718. I'm joined here today with Randy Greeley, who is the other legislative agent for Boston Firefighters Local 718. I'll try to keep my comments brief. Uh, everyone's made a, uh, some excellent points today, uh, so there's no need to uh, continue down that path. Uh, we, we all, I think, can agree that civil service is not a, is not a perfect system, uh, but it does work. Uh, it was established to stop nepotism in hiring, uh, and that's a key component in, in leaving civil service. That's going to open up to a system that is going to provide or perhaps even encourage nepotism. Um, Boston Firefighters Local 718 believes that leaving civil service should be a local option. Uh, each municipality should have that choice. Abandoning civil service is not a one-size-fits-all. There are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts and Boston is the largest municipality. Uh, what we have found and, and, and Representative Gordon mentioned this earlier because I've been on some of those hearings is that most municipalities that do not utilize civil service have demonstrated that there has been little if any increase in diversity. Uh, and that, that is a concern. Um, if that is, if getting out of civil service, if the goal is to increase diversity, it appears it's it's really not working. Um, but I, I could speak for Boston, which is the largest municipality in Massachusetts. And, and some of the information that I think is going, uh, some of the effects of coming out of civil service will affect not only uh, hiring, but our promotional exams. Um, promotional exams would now suddenly become costly to the municipality. In Boston, it costs approximately $2,500 per candidate to process a candidate. Uh, in Boston, we have about approximately 400 promotions a year. So that's gonna be costly to run those exams um, to promote. Uh, an average class of recruits for Boston Fire is about, is at least 50. We have a recruit class going on now of 85, but we're always around 50. Again, to process those candidates is gonna now become costly to the municipality. You're, you're, you're involving medical exams, psychologicals, background sitting for the exam, uh, the physical agilities test, uh, those are all things that should be factored into any municipality that chooses to leave civil service. Uh, in closing, one of the biggest problems that we see is going to be disciplinary hearings. We believe that it will now open up to a lot more lawsuits. Um, it will not be objective. You will not be appealing grievances or any labor disputes um, to civil service. It would now become and I believe it wouldn't be objective anymore. You'd be answering to the municipality that's actually being, you're being disciplined. Uh, in closing, just a couple things, and they were hit on here today. 
hiring in Boston, um, we provide veterans preference. That would disappear. We are gonna go down a road where the municipality is gonna be open to lawsuits uh, as a result of that. I know there are other people on this commission that could speak to that. Um, but as far as we're concerned, uh, and I'll echo what I said in the beginning, it, the system isn't perfect, but it does work. Thank you for the opportunity and I, I take any questions uh, if, if there are any. Thank you very much. And, and just to point out that while the system may not be perfect, we're tasked with the um, challenge of trying to make suggestions to make it better. So within civil service, as you see it now, do you have any, you, know, you can either make it now or, or get back to a same question was asked earlier. What are your suggestions that could make it better so that municipalities were less inclined to leave? I, I think what would make it better, I can only speak for Boston, uh, is having a relationship uh, or strengthening a relationship uh, with the city council uh, where we can sit down together and devise a plan that works um, for the department, for the union, and for the municipality um, and come up with some suggestions. I, I believe having everyone at the same table is helpful. I think everyone uh, on this commission would agree to that. That's you, You've had a lot of success thus far. Um, Boston is a very diverse city. We would encourage in promoting diversity. There are different ways to do that. Um, that could be a whole other Zoom call. Um, but I would think that at the end of the day, having a seat at the table would be the most important piece for us, uh, for our local, uh, is to sit down with city government, sit down with the commissioner, and come up with some key components uh, that everybody believes in moving forward. And that would include the hiring of diverse candidates that reflect the population in Boston, hiring candidates that have served their country, veterans, uh, and having a residency component. Uh, but those are all things that I think could be a complete separate conversation. So Rob Quinnen from Civil Service has a question. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, disciplinary hearings and um, I wanted to point out that there is um, a section of chapter 31A, it's section seven of the general laws that allows for municipalities to create um, a local merit appeals board to hear disciplinary appeals. But would it be the position of the PFFM uh, that the better course is for uh, disciplinary matters to be heard by the State Civil Service Commission? Well, I, I certainly can't speak uh, on the PFFM's position. That would be a, a question for President McKinnon. Um, but I believe, speaking for Boston Firefighters Local 718, any disciplinary board we would want to remain as objective as possible. Um, so anyone that is facing any disciplinary charges um, would have a fair, uh, a fair access to, to, to answering to those charges or grievances. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. President McKinnon, maybe um, since, since you were referenced, do you have uh, any thoughts on that question, which is the sort of the interplay between the opportunity or availability of a local board versus the civil service board. Oh, I, I think, yeah, he's, in, he's behind you, I think, right? Uh, Rich, Rich just, President McKinnon just stepped out. He okay. just stepped out. Uh, hold, hold on one second, he's right here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, you got called on. Uh, absolutely. What's the question? So the question was, uh, from Rob Quinnen was that the statute that we have uh, provides an opportunity for the municipalities to create a local board of review for appeals. And his question was, um, would it be, how would you compare that opportunity to the opportunity to have your appeal heard before the Civil Service Commission, the State Civil Service Commission? Before you answer, was that right? Yes. Rob, that's I, correct. Yeah, yep. okay. um, I would be very... I guess, hesitant as to who is appointing that local disciplinary board and, um, you know, how that process is, is done. Um, I truly believe that the disciplinary hearings at civil service are um, well done, true neutral. Uh, both sides get to uh, put their case on. And I would have a little hesitancy, not knowing the full uh, process, if you will, of establishing a local disciplinary uh, panel or board. Obviously, it's something that I need a little more information on. Okay. 
Thank you. Thanks. Not surprised with your answer. It, uh, uh, it's a good question. I, I think, uh, is Randy Greeley next on your panel? No, actually I have uh, Tom Ross from Somerville Fire. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify here today. Just to speak real quickly uh, on that uh, the, the bit about discipline. Uh, in most cases, under the collective bargaining agreements that each individual community has, uh, the discipline is normally done locally um, until such a point where it would have to uh, escalate to civil service. But that local discipline is done under the, uh, the tenets of civil service law. So uh, any kind of discipline that you would go first step, second step, and to the point where you get termination is done normally locally until the point would have to go in, uh, before civil service or before the courts. But it's all done under the under the um, uh, civil service, uh, uh, the books, chapter 31 law. So um, I just want to say a few things. I'm going to be try, try to be brief as I can, because I think that everybody is uh, pretty much uh, echoing each other's sentiments, but uh, civil service was established many, many years ago, uh, almost more than 100 years ago, and they have come up with volumes and tomes of uh, laws and personal administration uh, rules for countless scenarios concerning uh, employers and employees alike. Um, it was established to com combat nepotism and crony cronyism, as everyone has put that out, but to put us all on an equal footing. Uh, prior to civil service, there was an easy opportunity for those in power to handpick other people for jobs. It eliminates this corruption that's associated with the pay to play for jobs. And I think any kind of, um, any kind of return to the uh, old school is gonna give us the, the, same, the same sort of corruption. Uh, lawsuits that uh, are gonna be associated with uh, people being uh, jumped over tests, unfair tests. Uh, the hiring and promotion is based on testing. And the testing is the fairest mechanism that we have to hire qualified individuals. The highest score is void of race-based uh, uh, Im uh, implied bias. As a matter of fact, the civil service entrance exams and the promotional exams are all thoroughly vetted. And it takes quite a, a bit of work uh, with you know, people much smarter than myself to take a look at these tests and make sure those tests are written in such a way to be inclusive and without racial or gender bias. So they have fair testing. Uh, civil service has been proven over the decades to be impartial and the fairest way to adjudicate any kind of conflicts. Uh, you can just pick about any topic that you can think of, any, anything that arises. And in the past hundred years, there's laws in the books under chapter 31 to, to uh, account for how do we, how do we uh, go about uh, adjudicating this and, and uh, the conflict resolution. And there's laws that, uh, uh, on the books right now that civil service has established and, uh, and, and, and well, well used um, to protect employers and employees. The administration uh, uh, also is the first one to jump through uh, uh, the civil service books to say, hey, this is why we're going to have to suspend you. This is why we have the right to do it. This is why we have the right to, uh, to fire you. You know, um, uh, Richie uh, told a story about, uh, I'm sorry, Billy uh, Cabral told a story about the police chief, uh, the fire chief that they met that wanted to leave civil service because it was too hard to fire people. You know, um, they're real quick about getting rid of people just because they don't like them or they don't get along with them or they, they you know, uh, they don't have the same political views. You know, th th that's no reason to be firing people. We need to be able to have our constitutional rights to speak our mind and, and to protect ourselves and to form unions and, and to be able to have uh, associations that protect uh, each and every one of us on the job. Uh, there's a lot of talk today about uh, civil service being uh, dysfunctional, and uh, I think it's proven that it's difficult for any organization to be highly functioning when it keeps getting defunded, and defunded to the point of incompetence. Uh, many, many years ago, each individual community had a civil service uh, employee that worked at the town hall or city hall, and if you had a conflict, if you had a problem or a question about civil service, a question about promotions or testing or anything like that, you went right to that person. You know, they, they employed, I don't know, at, at some time, probably, you know, hun hundreds of people. And it's been defunded to the point where there's a handful of people working on uh, at, at Ashburton Place. And it's, it's difficult to get anything done when you keep defunding uh, an, an organization to, to the point where they're so overworked, they, they're going to run into problems and errors. They can't get things done quickly. 
We need to be able to expedite these, uh, these, these problems that we have with testing, and it can't be done with a handful of employees. We need to fully fund civil service, and we need to, you know, to prop it up, and we need to put some people in there that, you know, that can to take care of it. Uh, as far as uh, the matter we talked about, you know, the yearly testing as opposed to the biannual, um, I believe this should be um, a local option. The yearly testing um, is confusing. Uh, it's unnecessary. It leads to problems. It's going to lead to, uh, to, to litigation. You know, uh, by the time that you have candidates vest, uh, vetted, uh, they go through background checks. They go through uh, uh, physicals and, uh, and, and, you know, tr trying to find a place with them uh, in the academy. You know, nine months has gone by, 10 months has gone by, and you can't even call for another list after, after nine months because it's, it would be within uh, three months of the ending of the list. So we need to be able to keep those lists in effect for at least two years to be, to be um, you know, in, any kind of uh, problem-free uh, system that we could have uh, to, to hire people to get on the job. And the, the same thing goes with the, the promotional testing. Uh, you know, we, we need to have mechanisms in place to make sure that we have the, uh, the, the people uh, that who are promoted that deserve the job that are another one on the test. Uh, they, they have mechanisms in place right now to, to make sure that uh, the administration has a pick between, uh, you know, the top three. But, uh, you know, the, these measures have been put in place to protect the employees and to, uh, to assist the employer itself. So uh, if you have any uh, questions for me, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Before we go to the hand, Senator Brady, do you have any questions? Chair Brady? No, I do not. No, no, Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay, Ron Renault. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the PFFM and thank you for your service. It's all appreciated. Um, what I would just respectfully request, all the areas in which you think funding is, uh, further funding is necessary. If you could highlight some of those for us, I would take that and give it all the due consideration that you require. Yeah, and I believe that we'll all be uh, submitting writ written testimony also. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Okay, um, I'm going to bring up uh, Rob Green. Who is wait, the, wait, we have one more question. I'm sorry. Okay. Yep, Rob Quinnen. Yes, thank you. I'm a little bit confused about um, two comments I've heard now about things happening within three months of an examination. Um, I believe it was Billy Cabral who, um, and I may have misunderstood this, but I thought what he was saying was that the the door closes on a civil service community deciding to participate in an upcoming uh, civil service examination 90 days out from administration of the examination. And I'm not aware of any uh, state statute or regulation or rule um, that sets such a deadline. And so I'm wondering if it really is more a matter of uh, collective bargaining provision um, that, that states that um, a decision to participate in an upcoming examination must be made more than 90 days um, in advance of the examination. Um, and then I think our most recent speaker spoke about um, uh, something um, being prohibited within 90 days um, of uh, expiration of a list. And I'm, I'm a little bit confused about what that reference was. Yeah, I, I might have uh, contributed to that confusion myself, but um, when you, we, we were talking about the, uh, uh, the new regulations that would allow testing for uh, every year instead of biannual testing. So uh, you could call for a list. Um, every, every two years you have a new list, but you can't call for a new list if it's within um, three months of uh, another, another exam uh, to, be, to be held. So uh, I see. yeah, so I, I I may have made that a little bit confusing myself, uh, but that that's that's what it is. You can't call for an additional uh, list, and if there's within three months of an exam to be held. And do you know whether it's a fact that um, a community cannot decide to participate in an upcoming examination, um, uh, say seventy five days before that examination is scheduled to be administered? Uh, I'm not 100%, but I believe that would be covered under uh, the collective buying agreements of each individual uh, community. I see. Um, you know, they, they, they say when they will participate, especially with the promotional exams. Uh, we've had problems in our community with uh, participation in uh, chief of department exams. 
uh, the city can uh, choose not to uh, participate in it if they if they uh, they think that they don't need it. Um, I, I believe that that those exams should be held every two years, regardless. And you know, uh, let let the employees decide if they don't want to take that test because you never know when somebody's going to leave the job. You know, hey, I, I'd be happy if I won Powerball tomorrow. I probably wouldn't be back to work for the rest of the year. You know, <laughs> so uh, pe people leave jobs uh, all the time for whatever reasons, and it's it's not always planned. So I think it's a good idea. It's a good practice for each individual municipality to continue asking for uh, exams to be held on uh, on a regular basis, so we can have in stock right now um, a, a vetted uh, civil service uh, promotional exam list, and the same thing with with hiring. You know, because um, you you know they they might not be able to forecast how many positions that they need. They may not be able to forecast how many people are going to retire, or someone has to retire because of for illness or injury. So we need to have that, that list stocked up and ready to go uh, every single year. And some communities uh, choose not to participate in it. And I think that should be mandatory, in my opinion. Thank you for your testimony. I, I think the question concerned the exam for new hires, or at least even if it didn't, I'd like to know. So is it is it uh, your understanding that a municipality does not or can opt out of an exam for new hires with 75 days notice or so? Uh, I believe that is, I believe that is a uh, fact, but uh, I would have to double check with that again. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. I mean, civil service is a, a, a lot of laws. I, I can, okay. I, I can't, I can't testify if that's the actual case or not. Yeah. We can check that out. That's yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm going to bring up uh, Rob Green. Uh, he's the president of the uh, Lexington firefighters. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, and uh, thank you, Chair Gordon and uh, Chair Brady for this and the commission for your work so far. Uh, my name is Rob Green, I'm the president of Lexington Firefighters, representing all firefighters, lieutenants, and captains within Lexington Fire Department. Uh, Lexington Fire Department is a non-civil service department. We have never been in civil service, so I uh, testify from that perspective. Uh, keeping the goal of this commission in mind to improve diversity amongst public safety, uh, I think a, a key component of that is to increase the hiring pool, uh, the applicants that apply for these jobs. Uh, I can tell you from a Lexington perspective, uh, we currently have four job openings and we have six job applicants, six applicants for four positions. Uh, that is not a very big pool and that does not help us improve diversity. Um, you know, civil service provides a, a, a avenue for communities and through the state to pool resources together to increase our advertising of our, our, our public safety jobs, uh, recruitment to this profession. Uh, and it's not sustainable for 351 individual communities to advertise on their own. They do not have the funds to do that. They don't have the staff to do that. Uh, pooled resources is the only way to affect change in that, in that manner. Uh, and so, you know, being a non-civil service community, uh, we struggle quite a bit to recruit a large pool of candidates. Uh, and I think that it's, it's fair to say that um, you know, you're going to have a less diverse pool of candidates if the pool is smaller um, and that we, we need to increase the pool in order to improve on diversity. Uh, and so um, I fully support, um, you know, any changes or, or fixes to civil service. It's not a perfect system, as we've all testified to. Um, but I think that uh, with the you know, correct effort and uh, guidance, we can um, move forward and hopefully uh, move civil service in a direction that uh, makes communities want to be back in civil service. And, uh, and be part of that, that, uh, that large hiring pool. Uh, I yield my time if there's any questions. Thank you very much. Secretary Poppy, your hand was up first. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Officer Green, for your testimony. I guess I'm just curious, given your location in Lexington, um, when you talk about recruiting, if you reach out to Hanscom Air Force Base, you also have a National Guard uh, battalion right there on uh, Bedford Street there with military police. And just, just curious if you, because obviously uh, the military has a lot of diverse candidates uh, that would be available uh, once they get out of the military or some of them serving the reserve components, they'd also have, um, they'd have a lot of women uh, being the fastest growing population. So just, you know, just out of curiosity, if that's been an option you've tried to pursue. And if it's something we can help you with, I'm happy to assist. Yes, thank, thank you for your question, ma'am. Uh, as, a, as a union, we've, uh, we've 
provided multiple opportunities for the town to help uh, recruitment. Uh, but what I will say to your point of recruiting uh, veterans is we, we cannot effectively recruit veterans because civil service exists. If I'm a veteran in this state, I'm going to apply to almost 100 municipalities through a civil service exam that gives me uh, a veteran's preference than I would you know, applying to one department. Uh, we're a very affluent community. It's very expensive to live in the Lexington area. So your, your residency doesn't apply there. You're going to be applying to civil service, which is most likely has a residency and veteran's preference. So that is a, an, an avenue we could look into, but I can tell you that the way the system currently exists and us not being civil service, uh, most applicants would be, um, uh, would be applying to civil service. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, that's enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. It's an interesting point that you make because if you're retiring from service at Hanscom, you may or may not be staying in the area anyway, but you're probably not geographically tied to any one location. So you, you would be interested in the, in the, as many opportunities as you could get. Uh, Rob Quinnen. Uh, recently, the legislature enacted a, a special appropriation as part of a larger uh, COVID relief bill uh, that uh, appropriated half a million dollars um, for diversity scholarships uh, for police recruits. Um, I'm not aware of anything similar um, in the works uh, yet for uh, the fire service, but I'd like to ask this speaker whether um, the idea of diversity scholarships uh, would be attractive and also whether you perceive the need um, to create uh, a network between, say, the state's uh, mass careers hiring centers, the state's uh, community colleges, um, and the state's, uh, uh, you know, civil service system uh, with municipal fire departments to create a diversity pipeline um, from, say, either the state's hiring, uh, the, sorry, the state's career centers uh, referring people um, or uh, community colleges that have fire degree programs um, serving as a pipeline for, in particular, a probably more diverse pool um, of candidates given that most community colleges um, have a very healthy representation of um, minorities and underrepresented groups enrolled there? Yes, thank you for that question. And uh, I, I completely support uh, any programs that increase the uh, increase applicants, you know, increase the number of applicants looking to, to get in public safety or, or civil service positions at this point. Uh, and I think that goes back to my point that that has to be done with pooled resources. The more communities that are involved in civil service uh, and the more pooled resources through the state and through you know, the legislature funding civil service appropriately allows those programs to exist. Uh, just from a Lexington standpoint, the human resources department, the town and the department, and, and quite frankly, the union don't have the resources to, to establish programs like that that are effective in, in increasing our applicants. And so I, I support any program that increases the interest in public safety. It's a great profession, a great career. Um, but uh, we have to have pooled resources in, in order to advertise and recruit uh, new, uh, new applicants to, the, to our field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Lyons. Tom, you're Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, President Green, um, just two questions. One is, uh, Lexington, um, is that a reason? A re residence requirement um, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, the second question is, does the, the town of Lexington have a full-time veteran service officer? Thank you for those questions. Uh, for residency, I'll start there. Uh, we do not have a residency requirement. If they did, they'd have to pay us a lot more than they do already. The cost of living in Lexington is um, through the roof. Uh, and quite frankly, even the, the area surrounding Lexington, it's, it's really tough for our members to even live within 15 miles of Lexington at our current salaries. Um, so we do not. Uh, on the veterans uh, side, uh, I know we, we sh I believe we share a veterans officer with Bedford and it may be another community as well, but I, we, we do not have a full-time veterans agent. Uh, and I can tell you, if you looked at our, our roster of, uh, of, of firefighters, uh, we have you know, per, per capita a lot less veteran firefighters, that f firefighters that served in the military than most area departments in civil service. And that, that is due to the, the veterans preference. And I think that if you're, a, if you're a veteran looking to get into this field, 
you're going to apply yourself to civil service before you are a non-civil service community. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service as a firefighter. And thank you for your service to our country. Thanks, sir. Thank you. I can, uh, I can, I can agree with the answer to your question is uh, Bedford and Lexington do, do share one veteran service officer, uh, Tina Rada, who does a great job. Who is up? Uh, any question, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Chairman Brady, you're on mute though. You're still on mute, Senator Brady. Chair Brady, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I, I just unmuted. I'm sorry about that. Um, President Green, um, has Lexington ever had been involved with civil service in your knowledge in the past or have they never been? Uh, Lexington uh, Fire has never been in civil service. We've uh, tried to get in multiple times, but um, the uh, town government has, uh, has not been uh, an advocate for that. And I know you mentioned it's been difficult to hire veterans where you're not a civil service committee. Do you know the percentage ratio of the employees that are on the fire department as far as percentage of minorities, women, or veterans? Do you have that uh, off? If you don't have it off the top of your head, you can get it to us later. I'm just curious. Absolutely. Uh, so veterans were probably around 15% of our department are veterans, which is substantially lower than most uh, civil service communities. Uh, minorities, uh, we currently have one minority on our job and three females, and we have 61 uh, firefighters and defense captains within Lexington. Okay, thank you, President, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, Rich McKinnon, who, who would you like to call up next? Uh, yeah, Rich just stepped out, uh, Chairman. Uh, if, if we could, um, President John Soares of Boston 718 is on. He's not in our office, but uh, he has a uh, pressing matter he needs to attend to. If he could hop in and uh, testify, if that'd be okay with you, Chairman. Yep. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman Gordon, Chairman Brady, members of the commission. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. Uh, I'm John Swords, the uh, president of Local 718, the Boston Firefighters. Um, pretty much everyone uh, has, you know, um, talked about the points that are, are so important about civil service. For us, it takes politics out of the game. Um, the, uh, you know, the as far as promotions on that side of it, we are. Uh, it's merit-based, you put the time in and um, you're rewarded that way. Um, and the discipline side, we, um, we need that for an avenue to help, help our members get taken care of if they do. Um, to Tom Lyon's point, we do have the cadet uh, program. It, it still hasn't gotten off the ground yet. There's a lot of funding that needs to, be taken, that needs to take place there. Um, but I do see that as a way for us to uh, um, bring some uh, diversity in, but um, uh, that's that's all I have for you. And I thank you for your time. I thank the commission for what they're doing, and uh, stay safe out there in the snow this weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks for your testimony, Chair Brady. Do you have any questions? No, I think you don't. I think you're saying no. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this. Uh, does the PFFM want to call in the next your next member, or do you want me to do that? Yep. Chair Gordon, we have one last person in office here. Okay, uh, that's uh, Drew Pamonte. He's from the uh, Springfield local with the. Okay. Oh, not a mute. Can you guys all hear me? You can. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to address the commission. Like everybody else said, thank you for your hard work and all that. I'm a member of Springfield Mass Fire Department. We have currently 280 members. I started in 1995. I'm currently in my 26 years of service. And I have, we have been a civil service department and I have seen the pros and cons of civil service. Like the other members said, it's, not, it's definitely not a perfect system, but it's a system we're in now that offers us uh, checks and balances. You know, I'm, I'm a veteran as well. I've, I've benefited from veterans preference. I was a Lieutenant for 18 years and then I've, took exams to make captain that were all unbiased and they were, they were well, the lists were given to all the candidates and the candidates took the exams. I've been, I was local president in my local where we've had members that were disciplined, that were able, that were disciplined unjust and were able to appeal to civil service and prevail. And then we've had members that were disciplined that didn't prevail for this and management actually prevailed. 
Uh, we've had several members that were bypassed for promotion that were able to fi file appeals through civil service as well. And, and they were they were met with an impartial hearing officer and, and uh, had their cases heard. And then the awards were awarded accordingly. From a personal perspective, in 2002, I was just starting out as an executive board member on my local, and we had a con finance control board come into the city due to uh, financial shortfalls in the city of Springfield. We had to lay off 52 firefighters and 13 officers got demoted where the 52 firefighters walked out the door. They were able to have opportunities through civil service to be able to seek employment in other departments by receiving cards in the mail where there was vacancies for positions to be filled. I was one of the local ones, uh, lucky ones. I was demoted, but I was able to retain my rank once the finance finance situation was stabilized and was that was all offered through civil service. And it's, it's definitely, like I said, it's, it's uh, civil service definitely gives us our, our routes of appeal. It also gives us our rights to maintain employment if there is financial shortfalls. And that, like I said, it was tough watching 52 guys walk out the door, but in the long run, they got employment throughout the Commonwealth and they were able to come back and work for the city of Springfield, which is ultimately where they wanted to be. Uh, that being said, I, I, uh, I was elected to district five vice president for the PFFM. I represent 30 locals in Western Mass. Uh, we have one of the first things that was dropped into my lap was a wrongful termination by a fire board of fire commissioners that was siding with the chief. So a woman that was terminated was able to file another appeal through civil service and ultimately she prevailed after and was able to get her job back. So I just wanted to cite a few strong incidents that uh, that I was that I've been a part of as being a union leader. And I will offer this too. I uh, like I said, I started in 1996. I'm a second generation firefighter. When my father started, there was over 500 firefighters on the department, and one of them was a minority. He was the first black firefighter in the city of Springfield, Lenny Corbin. I knew him personally as a child. He would come over to my father's house and have beer. I was hired a long time after uh, I met Lenny. I was 25, and Lenny was still on the job. And I can tell you this: there wasn't a lot of minorities on the job when I started. There was a handful, and so between now and then, my department is represented by 53% minorities. They were able to take the promotional exams that were offered, and a lot of my friends from high school and guys that I've known coming up into the department are all now line officers, and they they share upper management positions. So, like I said, the system does work. Uh, as far as the residency goes, I would like to speak on that. I, I know the uh, commission's going to. Um, I would like the commission to take a long, hard look at residency. I was a union president when uh, we had to negotiate residency into our contract because we have a three-part process. As you all know, we have to uh, negotiate, get our deal at the table, bring it back to the body to be ratified. And then ultimately our city council has to ratify our contract for approval. The contract before we uh, negotiated residency, our city council was 13 members. They were loud and clear. They, they turned around and looked right at us and said, we will not ratify any contract that comes before us without a residency clause. So they're basically bullying us into a, into negotiating a residency policy. If this commission would look into a, a, like the legislation that was brought up earlier in the meeting, I think it's definitely a, a topic that needs to be addressed as far as having, a, you know, whether it be the mileage or just a, a legislation that, that doesn't force cities and towns to make locals bargain a, a benefit that they don't want to bargain. But like I said, it, it, I, it definitely, it's been a hot topic in Springfield. If any of you guys have followed it, if not, just Google it and it'll come up. We have recently had a big, federal lawsuit that, that involved residency. I just think if there was a clear defining legislative statute that said, this is what residency is, this is what the requirements are, and this is what you meet. It would solve a lot of problems. I thank you for your time. I know there's a lot of people that want to speak. And I, again, I appreciate all your hard work on the commission. I will be submitting written testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your testimony. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, I, I think- oh, wow. we can, yeah. like small. can we mute? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. The witness is leaving. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Rich, do you have okay. oh, wait? Oh, Neil Osborne. Neil, can you mute? There you go. <laughs> I'm here. I'm sorry. What was the question? Oh, can you can you mute? Sorry. Yes. Because we could just hear back there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rich McKinnon. Or do you want to call the next person or is that your uh, that that's all we have in the office, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay. We go we refer back to your list. Okay, so now I've got the list of um, of members of PFFM or otherwise firefighters who have test who signed up to testify. And like I said, we'll go back to our our three minutes that we're looking for. But everybody that wants to testify can um, also submit written testimony. We we are interested in what you have to say, each and every one of you. So the next person on the list is William Taylor.
William Taylor, do you want to testify? Or are you? I see you uh, are here. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am uh, president of Marble Firefighters, Local 1714, the International Association of Firefighters, also associated with professional firefighters in Massachusetts. I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the opportunity to once again testify before this committee. I did so several months ago. Um, and I, as part of that testimony, I offered the, the city of Marlboro uh, just several years ago, 2016, um, the mayor and his fire chief from Salem, New Hampshire, convinced our city council that it was a good idea to vote us out of civil service. Nothing groundbreaking, same old arguments that we've heard a thousand times. The city is going to become more diverse uh, without the restrictions under civil service, i.e. veterans and residential preferences. Um, City of Marble Fire Department has made many new hirings over the past five years, uh, upwards of 20 or more. Uh, We have currently in the process of hiring several more firefighters uh, right now as we speak. We have not become more diverse, Mr. Chairman. That that was a... uh, that was a false statement on the on the mayor and the chief and lawyers and whoever were involved in that original presentation to the city council, uh, which I testified at. And, you know, the city council did their thing. They went the other way. Um, we're not only a, uh, not a more diverse workforce, as they said we would be. They've made absolutely no effort to getting us there. There is no recruitment effort. There is no. There's nothing locally, uh, whether it be uh, trade days, uh, uh, school school days at uh, the local vocational school or community centers or, or anything. Uh, there has been no effort made by the city to do that. So uh, a lot of my testimony is going to be the same as we've heard already. Civil service, as we all know, we can all agree. It's not perfect. But I, I think my point is you don't fix something by blowing it up. The way to fix it is to fund it properly. We've heard this over and over. Uh, President McKinnon spoke on it earlier. It has to be properly funded. I believe uh, Vice President Ross uh, made that point as well. As far as uh, you know, when I got on the uh, when I get on our job thirty plus years ago, there was a person in every community that could handle basic civil service questions. And in order to get answers on uh, issues now, uh, you, you're dealing with a, just a handful of people at Ashburton Place, it's very difficult for locals to get information out of there. Um, as far as what we've done in Marlboro, what people don't understand, what, the, what MMA um, advocates will not tell you is that an, an exorbitant cost that it costs to do your own system. Um, not everyone is uh, able to do what they've done in Marlboro. Not everyone is financially able throughout the Commonwealth. So uh, the other part of it, and also shows will be associated with a substantial cost. We have several pending grievances regarding the lack of consistency within the hiring process, uh, within the promotional process, I'm sorry. Uh, Thus far in Marlboro, my opinion, um, many others, that uh, a Marlboro being a non-civil service department for the size of the city that we are has been nothing short of a nightmare. We've done four promotional processes, each one of them, even though we have language providing a path for how them, for the way that it's supposed to be done, they've done it four different ways. Those are all, uh, we're pending arbitrations on several of those cases coming up in the next few months. Um, but I urge the committee to recommend that the current civil service commission is funded properly so it can be improved upon. And by doing so, it will enable civil service to operate at a much greater efficiency and at a more affordable cost to all of its member communities, uh, possibly even attracting communities who have left to come back. Um, and again, it has to be, these things have to be done so we can promote consistency throughout this commonwealth. Uh, you know, what we do in Marlboro shouldn't be vastly different from the way they do business in New Bedford or Lowell or Boston or Springfield. It should be the same. 
everyone should have that same benefit of uh, residential preference, however that ends up in the end. Um, with military service, veterans definitely should have a preference coming on this job. And it shouldn't be different from community to community. I believe that civil service offers a path to make everyone equal, every community to do things by the same process. Okay, Mr. Taylor, I appreciate that. You're a little beyond your time. What I would encourage you to do, though, is reach out to Vice Chair Higgins, Natalie Higgins, uh, who is chairing the subcommittee on the issues you're talking about, because we'll make sure that your opinions are listened to as the reports are being made. So thank you for that. I, I do see a, a hand from Francis, Francisco. You're not on the commission. And so the questions are really coming from commissioners. And I appreciate that. But if I, I was calling you, then it would. You know, it would no, be I, I did not understand that. Thank you for thank, clarifying thank you. that. Thank you. Uh, Natalie Higgins, uh, uh, Vice Chair Higgins. Thank you, Chairman Gordon. Uh, Mr. Taylor, thank you for your testimony. I uh, just want to echo what uh, the chair said. Any data um, that you can give to kind of show the, the, the cost for running your own system within a municipality, um, the, the lack of an increased diversity, because that is what so many of the communities who have left civil service in the last decade have been citing as a, a major motivator, um, would be incredibly helpful. We're trying to seek that from the communities themselves. Um, and we haven't gotten that data to back up uh, their their uh, desire for increased diversity. So anything that you can do to help kind of flesh that out, especially in the city of Marlboro, we would greatly appreciate. I will certainly submit that with my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I'm also interested in the issue of liability of the municipalities that go on their own. And I know we have a commissioner from the Mass Bar Association. Maybe it's something you don't have to you know, offer your opinion here, but just maybe look into that and, and uh, be in touch with Vice Chair Higgins uh, on that issue. Because just speaking as a lawyer myself, when you're not into the civil into civil service and you're doing it on your own, it would seem to me that you may have some responsibility there. Secretary Poppy, thank you again, Mr. Chair. And this, I I put my hand up, and and uh, Commissioner Higgins actually touched on it. I, I was just generally going to ask if we, and I apologize if we received it already and I missed it somehow, but as part of this, could we get information from, and maybe civil service has provided it already on the, the same data, you know, the number of veterans, the number of minorities or percentages, the number of women on these departments. I really think for us to look at this, we need to review a lot of the data that goes, um, that's, you know, to, to support everything that's been presented. And it would just help us as we're looking at this, you know, as we finalize getting close to the report. That'd right. be very helpful to me and hopefully helpful to the other commissioners. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Okay, anything else for the wit for the, this witness? Chair Brady. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm glad no. the Secretary mentioned that because I was going to ask the same thing, just so we save time. If all the um, just different districts are on, if they can get us that data and then we can share it with all the people on the commission, um, that would be helpful to compare different communities from one to another. Thank you. Okay, do we have Jim Snow here? Jim Snow? Going once. Let's see if I see you over here. Yes, I do. You're here. Good morning. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jim Snow. I'm president of the Swarthka Firefighters Union Local 1459. Um, we're probably the newest community to come out of civil service. Both police and fire came out just this past October. On October 19th, the governor signed the home rule petition to take us out. Um, we spent months and months and months negotiating. Uh, replacement language uh, to replace civil service with a, a hiring policy, a promotional policy, and a seniority layoff, demotion, discipline policy. Um, the ink isn't even dry. And in December, the chief has already violated that policy on hiring. He eliminated the uh, upper age limit that we both had agreed to. And we have found out that the town has not accepted the town administrator nor the select board have approved um, the language that we negotiated in good faith. We were pushed to get a ratification vote. We did that in early October. It is now the end of January. They have not approved it. They've gone forward with um, uh, posting uh, for a 
firefighter entrance exam next week on uh, February 5th and February 12th. Um, the chief did not put a closing deadline date on the posting for the jobs. And after it was taken down, he assisted at least two people uh, from the public with finishing their applications. So already we're having problems. The, the union has filed a grievance against the, the fire chief in the town for violating the hiring policy. We are uh, in the process of uh, filing charges at labor relations for bargaining in bad faith. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but if the ink isn't even dry and we're already having problems with our first exam and we're only roughly three months in one week into, into the uh, leaving civil service, we don't know what's gonna happen next. I've been a member of the uh, town of Swanscombe as an employee for, I'm in my 40th year, 39, as a member of the Swanscombe Fire Department, I'm currently a captain. I've been president for around 15 or 16 of the last um, years. And um, it's, it's not getting any better. Um, and frankly, we're disappointed. We thought that, that um, we were gonna have a more uh, open communication with the town and things were gonna go smoothly and they certainly haven't already. Um, the town in their process for leaving civil service, they were supposed to send a letter at least 120 days prior to um, the uh, vote uh, they were supposed to send a letter uh, to the administrative civil service. That was not done. They violated 31A section five. They uh, also um, did not word the Warren article in the town meeting correctly to um, have the vote to come out of civil service. They also have not accepted section four, which is adopts a personnel ordinance in replace of uh, 31. As far as we know, they haven't adopted anything on 31A to replace 31. Um, as far as we know, the police department hasn't had any problems yet. They've already held their first uh, written exam in a PAT. We're waiting to see what happens in another week or two. Um, the fire chief told us last week during our grievance hearing that the town had paid for the hiring of the, the um, exam company, but the hiring of proctors to run the exam is coming out of his budget. There was no extra money put in our budget. We're already um, stretched out now and um, there's no funding mechanism that we know of. And currently there's no HR director and hasn't been for months and months and months. Okay, um, I'm gonna thank you for your testimony because sure. you're on your time. However, I see Vice Chair Higgins dutifully taking notes on what you're saying because this does, again, go right to the topic that she's in her subcommittee is addressing. And so she can, she'll reach out to you and, and Swanska you. or the other way around if she needs further testimony. Thank you. It's important testimony that you're offering. And it seems to be the rule rather than the exception from what we've heard. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Mark Exarpolis. And I, and I don't see you on the, as a, I don't see you here. So I'll go quickly, Mark Exarpolis. I don't see anyone. Spelled, spelled near to that if I'm not spelling it right. So I will continue to look for Mark and William Cross. I think you are here. Let's take a look. William, oh, wait a minute, maybe you're not. Uh, nope, okay. Let's go to uh, Scott Figgins. I understand that some of you have heard testimony that would touch on what you were gonna say. So that may be why you're not here and you've hopefully left written testimony. So Andrew Rokes. We don't see you here, okay. Um, Joshua Hetzler. Let's see, do I, hear, do I see Josh? I do, you're here, Joshua Hetzler. Joshua, I see you on, I see you're here. IAFF, local 1314, Joshua. All right, I'm gonna, you may have left the room. So I'm gonna go to John Brophy. You're here. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Okay, and I'll come back to Joshua. All right, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, just thank Representative Gordon, Senator Brady and the members of the commission for allowing me to speak today. 
Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, Local 925, the uh, Professional Firefighters of Peabody, Massachusetts. I am the president of said organization. I also work as a lieutenant in that organization. Um, I echo many of the same sentiments that have been said here before me, but I just want to focus on two specific examples uh, where civil service has really proved to be vital in our organization in protecting our members. Uh, the first was a recent decision uh, that actually came out where the my city wrongfully uh, bypassed a candidate uh, for your records. It's dockets number G1-18-209 and G1-19-070. Uh, the long and short of it is um, the city arbitrarily and wrongfully bypassed a candidate for an entrance uh, examination to basically hire two of um, two friends of the mayor. Uh, it's well documented. And if it wasn't for civil service, this particular person really wouldn't have had any recourse to hopefully uh, get the job that he rightfully deserves. Uh, the second uh, example that I have specific to my particular organization is uh, just recently this past year, uh, City of Peabody changed how we do promotional examinations. So historically, it had always been a system where it was based 80% on a written examination and 20% on education experience. Uh, in order for this to change, it's widely well known and respected that uh, cities and towns have to basically bargain to change that. The reason being is it prevents cities and towns from being able to go in and arbitrarily change examinations to uh, basically cater them to candidates that they want to promote. Uh, the city did this basically without any negotiations, and we're currently uh, in talks to try and rectify this situation. But the long and short of it is this, without civil service, we wouldn't have the ability to prevent this nepotism and to ensure that the right candidates are either A, coming on the job, or B, being promoted throughout the ranks. Uh, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you for sharing those experiences. Chair Brady, do you have any questions? Okay. I'm all set, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, I don't see hands raised. So thank you very much for your testimony. The next person on the list is Brian Smith, Whitman Fire. Hello. First, I'd like to start thanking this panel um, and my colleagues listening to my testimony today on this important issue. My name is Brian Smith. I'm a fire lieutenant with the Whitman Fire Department. I'm currently in my 18th year as a full-time firefighter. I started my career with three plus years outside of civil service with the King's Fire Department in the last 14 years within civil service with the Whitman Fire Department. Within the last few years, the promotional process was negatively affected by our fire. Brian, can I interrupt you for a myself second? And Brian, can me? Brian? A flawed interview process in our town that resulted in appeals and possible litigation. Myself and another top test, we were on time. Yes. Okay, Brian. Does anyone else yes. have trouble hearing Brian? Just raise your raise your hand. Hello? Yeah, your bandwidth is low, Brian. So, um, can you, if you're on your laptop, can you move? Can you hear? We can't. We could. We really can't hear your testimony. Yes. If you're, if you can move to another location to get a better connection to your router. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to call in the next witness and, and see if you can uh, if you can address that, and I'll come back to you. So I'm going to call in David Keene, and I'll come back to Brian. Oh, Brian, you want to try it? it still says you're being with. Can you hear me more clear now? It's not. I don't think it's better. Can you say anything? Yeah, you're frozen. Can you hear me now? It's not, we can't, we can't really make out what you're saying. Hello? Can you hear me? Why don't you do this, Brian? Why don't you try it on your phone? Try to call back okay. on your phone. I'll stand by. Let me see if that will work. Um, I don't know if that's going to get any better. So I, well, this is what I'm going to do, because I, I just don't want us to have to wait. David Keene, can you testify? Brian, I'm going to come back to you as soon as you've got that straightened out. David Keene? Yes, yep. Mr. Chair. I just didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, no, and we'll come back to Brian. 
Go ahead. You, you, sir? Yep. You start off, David, then we're going to come back to Brian. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Chairman Gordon and Chairman Brady and Commission for hearing me. Um, I'm not going to hop on a number of what's already been discussed today. I just like to touch on what were a couple of questions earlier as far as how do we strengthen civil service and funding is the obvious answer. Okay. But, I, but I think it's also training. And, you know, we, we have um, a person who worked in our office who could pick up the phone, call the civil service, knew exactly, they knew one another through phone conversation. Um, I, I think better at our interaction, better training, um, a better understanding of what civil service is doing. And the only way to do that is through funding and, and, and training within the communities and civil service itself so we can help understand one another better. Uh, I represent, I I'm sorry, I should have explained who I am, um, District Vice President of District 4, in the PFFM, a low firefighter. Um, so I'm, I represent a lot of locals up in the Merrimack Valley and of, of a majority of the non-civil service communities, the members don't live, some of them don't even live close. I was in Pepperell yesterday and one of the brothers that was the secretary treasurer drives from Peabody every day to go to work in Pepperell. Um, so they're not getting candidates from the community to work. Townsend is another community that I represent and I believe it's one out of the five or six, their numbers fluctuate, is actually from Townsend or even really within an ability to get there within an hour, quite frankly. So, you know, my other concern is obviously being being a, um, a veteran of the Marine Corps, uh, when, when we start weakening an ability for a man or woman who served their country to get on a job as, um, as President Green had testified to in Lexington, I, I think we do a disservice to those veterans. The, the, these kids go and, and you know, we, we've just left one war. We're on the eve of possibly a second. And we're doing a disjustice to these. I say kids, and I say that without disrespect, that just because I'm at an age now where I feel, I feel like everybody is a kid now. Uh, but these men, quite frankly, men and women who are willing to forfeit anywhere from four to 32 years of their life, 20 years of their life, and then they come back and they come back to that community that they grew up in and all they may have wanted to be was a Marine infantryman and a firefighter or a police officer. Um, and, and those are the issues that, that, that I see. And I'm, I'm just going to keep it brief. Like I said, I can go on and on and continue to pontificate on what's already been spoken, but I think uh, it would behoove me to yield the rest of my time. And I thank you very much. And I hope everyone stays safe over the weekend. Thank you very much. And, uh, as a frequent visitor of Lowell, thank you for your service to Lowell. Um, Mr. Chair, Brady, Mr. Chair. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Maureen for a service to our country as well, and uh, no questions. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions from the commission, so I'm gonna try Brian Smith again. Brian, have you worked out your communication? Can you, can you, hear, me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're much better, so let's try that. All right, I apologize for that. I would like to first stop by thanking this panel and my colleagues for listening to my testimony today on this important issue. My name is Brian Smith. I am a fire lieutenant within the Whitman Fire Department. I'm currently in my 18th year as a full-time firefighter. I started my career with three years plus out of civil service and the last 14 plus years within civil service. Within the past few years, our promotional process was negatively affected by our fire chief. Myself and others were subjected to a flawed interview process within our town, resulting in appeals and possible litigation. I, as myself, as well as another uh, co-worker, topped our test and uh, remained on the top of our promotional list. We were both bypassed for biased, and in my opinion, nefarious reasons by a feckless fire chief. I found myself wondering, how can I afford to fight the town? What, will this have, what effect will this have on myself mentally and my family? Fortunately, civil service in my town found us to be in the right and made sure not to let this nonsense go on. I truly fear what may have happened if not the civil service. As I stated, the financial implications and mental burden on this and my family weighed heavily on me. In conclusion, management left unchecked is bad for business. With civil service, rogue fire chiefs will not be allowed to circumvent the rules to their benefit. 
It is a checks and balance system that helps keep administration in line and to make sure the promotional process we have in, is set in place continues without bias. Civil, so, civil service is important and should be fully funded and kept in place. I would be happy to answer any follow-up questions in regard to this matter. Well, thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry what you went through, but I'm, I'm glad that you stood up for yourself and you had a, a good result. Uh, Chair Brady, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brian, for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the commission. Our next witness is Matthew Reddy. And Matthew, I do not see that name with us right now, but I'll call it in case you're here with someone else's phone. Matthew Reddy. Okay. I will move on. And if you're here, just jump in. But Craig Long. Craig Long. I do not see Craig Long's name. So if you're here, just jump in. Uh, next is Richard Paris. Do I see you here? I do not see Richard Paris. And again, I understand that these folks may be submitting written testimony. Um, William Hill. I think I do see you here. Yes, William here, the FFM eboard. Okay, you're on mute. Oh, I apologize. I hit it twice. You got me now? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for their work on this uh, committee. Um, it's obviously a very important subject and appreciate your time today. Um, so, my name is William Hill. I, I'm a 27 year member of the Brockton Fire Department. I serve as an executive board member of the PFFM, also president of Brockton Firefighters Local 144, representing 207 members, which includes not only firefighters, but fire alarm operators and electricians and mechanics, so, which are all civil service. Um, so, with that, um, you know, I don't want to go over and rehash a lot of stuff that's already been said. Um, I think everybody's gotten the message that civil service needs to be funded. Um, you know, just a couple of things, you know, the city of Brockton, similar to Springfield, we had layoffs um, in the early 90s um, where many of our members, um, you know, were sent out the door. Fortunately, from civil service, they were able to pick up jobs and support their families and other communities because of that, of the civil service protections for hiring. Um, so we had that same issue. Um, you know, for myself personally, when I first took the exam um, many years ago, it was only $35 to take the exam, um, you know, to include people in this process, you know, the, the take an exam is $250, I believe, currently, um, you know, and for someone to take, you know, especially if they're taking public safety, to take two exams, um, take police and fire, that's $500. If they're taking it every year now, you're talking a thousand dollars. So I think making it fair for everybody, um, you know, to lower that cost would be one way of bringing more people in and getting them on the list, um, which obviously would be subsidizing it for everybody um, to take this job or to, you know, try to get this job. Um, you know, here in Brockton, we pretty much go straight down the list. Um, you take the exam, everybody gets the same books, um, you know, and they just, you go straight, you know, and then now they actually the department even offers um, the books so guys can actually um, utilize uh, free books in the firehouse. Um, and to the a couple of things I want to cut up my time, but I was thinking when I was talking, there was the talk about, um, I, I don't know if it was the Commissioner Quinnen was talking about 30 days and they were kind of, we had an issue, uh, I'm not sure I was in and out. But we had an issue in Ham Brockton where we were hiring members. And if you if you do this testing every year, um, we were hiring members and the city of Brockton spent all the money doing background checks. We took guys off the trucks to, to do all that, get that process going. And then we couldn't hire them because the new list came out and they didn't have an offer of employment. So if you're doing one year tests, it's really it, it wouldn't be a one uh, well, one year hirings. You wouldn't be one year because if you're three months out, you're hiring 10 guys. It takes a few months to get through all that process of background checks and interviews. So, um, so there's a few things, you know, obviously I think the civil service system needs to be properly funded. 
100%. Um, recruitment, if you're going to do recruitment, you know, you put it on the, the backs of um, individual communities is a huge, you know, we don't have the resource in Brockton to put one guy out on there all the time. So I know my time is up. I appreciate the um, opportunity to speak and um, we'll be submitting testimony. And again, thank you everybody for your work on this and good luck this weekend in the blizzard. Thank you very much. And I suspect that Chair Brady is going to have a question for you. I have no questions. I just want to thank um, President Hill for his testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quinnen. I happen to have uh, data handy that shows that um, the Brockton Police Department has done a good job in diversifying, um, at least at the entry level, uh, that it has gone in the past five years from 35% um, Black or Latino members of the Brockton Police Department to 45% currently. Hmm. I don't have any comparable data for the Brockton Fire Department. And I was wondering if you could comment on how Brockton is doing uh, in diversifying uh, within the fire department. So unfortunately, I don't have the exact numbers and I would hate to put a number out there without having the definitive number. I know since my hiring, um, we've taken on, uh, we have three women um, and also actually one of those women, the two of those women were actually veterans um, that we hired, but I can supply that information. Um, you know, we do the recruit, we've been doing recruitment for years, um, you know, going up to the high school, um, and other, you know, the department has, and recently we did just like a, a Saturday outside the library, posted it on Facebook and, you know, all that kind of social media stuff. So, um, you know, we're getting more into it. Unfortunately, you know, we need guys on the trucks, you know, and to have a special person just to do, uh, recruitment is difficult, but our current chief has, um, you know, been actively pushing, um, you know, trying to get out into the uh, community. I know he's been working with um, a lot of the um, the clergy in the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the community. He actually just took on three chaplains from uh, three additional chaplains um, of all different um, uh, faiths. So um, we're trying to get in um, through that way you know, to get the understanding, you know, out of to, to everybody in the city about the job. I mean, not for nothing. I mean, when I took this job, it was, you know, I knew there were firefighters. So I drove into one Ashburton place and took, you know, got all the information, watched the VHS, VHS tape. And, you know, we got guys pull up to the station. I tell them, Google it. And that's the thing, like if civil service had more stuff on that, I mean, more videos, more money, more funding, you know, it would help get, you know, people to understand what the job's about um, in both sides of public safety. Right. Thank you very much for your response. Thank you. And uh, that's good advice. We've heard that from some of the other civil service agencies as well. Okay, James Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I, I have over two pages of written testimony that I'll submit, pretty much echoing what the other people given testimony today have said. I would prefer to let some of the other people on this list speak uh, to their points. Uh, with that being said, I represent Plymouth Firefighters. I'm also a district vice president for the Professional Firefighters of Massachusetts. And I wanted to touch on something real briefly with uh, what Rob Green from the Lexington Local said about his veterans. We are a civil service community, uh, community from the chief all the way down to firefighter. We have 135 firefighters, 84 of which are veterans that were hired through civil service. So I just want to get those numbers out there for you guys. And like I said, I will be submitting uh, my two pages uh, via written testimony. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Chair Brady, questions? I don't see, thank you. I don't see questions from anyone else from the commission. So thank you very much for your testimony. Paul Medeiros. Paul Medeiros, are you here? I don't see that name here. So I am going to call on, I, the next name is John Saro, which I do not see here. Nope. Uh, Jason Burns. Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, Secretary Pape has her hand up. Oh, you do. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm asking a lot of questions this morning, so I'm apologizing in advance. But I, I, I wanted to do kind of the same follow up if, um, um, if, if President Brown would share how many um, you shared, how many veterans are you all? Do you also have the data on how many minorities? and women 
And some of those may all be the same uh, are on the department as well. If not, we're going to be requesting that from everyone. Yeah, I, and I can't give you a definitive answer right now. I know we have four females. We have multiple uh, people of color on our job and I can definitely get you that information later on. Um, I would just say we're pretty much reflective of our community down here uh, as far as it, it goes to come to that, but I will gladly uh, get you that information. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Jim Young, you're next on the list. Jim Young, your name is here, are you here? Okay, if you come back to your computer, Ross Bona. Hi, uh, Chairs Gordon and Brady. Thank you for uh, letting me speak today uh, and the commissioners and all the work you guys are doing. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of quick points. Um, the reason why I think that uh, civil service needs to be fully funded. Um, for me, uh, they are a unbiased checks and balances to the system. Uh, without that, uh, as said before, patronage and, uh, you know, favors come into uh, hiring processes and promotional processes. Uh, it makes our, my members uh, feel good to be able to go into a process where they know that they're uh, up against another candidate for a promotion and how they study and what type of a firefighter they are will make it uh, come out on top if, if they do well enough. Um, I, I do think that towns do not take advantage of uh, civil service. I know my town does not. Um, they do not use them to do any promotions, any uh, recruiting. Uh, I think they're a valuable asset to all the communities in the state to do that. Um, and they just not, they don't take advantage of it for, for one reason or another. Um, and regarding to veterans, uh, you know, I, I've watched all the civil service hearings that you guys have done in the past uh, months, and the, the things that I kept on seeing from the MMA is, is their their mission kept on changing. It was uh, diversity one time, it's timing another time, it's a cost uh, saver, and um, I unfortunately had to go through a civil service battle with my town uh, in 2020. Uh, it started in 2019, and I've done so much research with the help of the members of the PFFM and uh, Jesse Flynn from the veterans, um, that uh, our veterans are the ones that are the most diverse uh, community out there. And to not take advantage of that, uh, of the retiring members from, civil, uh, from uh, our armed forces, uh, would be an injustice. Uh, these, these folks put their lives on the line for us and um, not to give them a, a, a step to become a police officer or a firefighter would be a, a serious injustice. Both of my uncles were Newton firefighters. They were both veterans um, and had this ability when they, they came back. Um, so, uh, you know, and those, those quick points are just some of the reasons why uh, I, I feel that so, uh, civil service should be fully funded. Um, I, I do had I did have one question during my um, uh, interactions with the town meeting members of my town when they asked me what has civil service done for you, and I said other than giving me uh, an unbiased and a fair way to become a firefighter, they haven't had to do anything for me, uh, and I equated it to having car insurance and home insurance. I've had those for thirty years. I haven't had to use them once. But if something does happen, it's nice to have uh, the backing of an insurance company. And I equate civil service as an insurance company because they're there to help you and they're there to help the town as well. The, uh, the communities uh, benefit by having civil service itself. You, you can take a look at Wellesley. If, uh, I bet if you talk to the town administrator or manager of the city of Wellesley, town of Wellesley, I bet he wished he had uh, civil service there after what they've gone through in the uh, sanctioning of their chief and fines of their chief. Uh, I'm sure they open themselves up to lawsuits from, from different people. And um, I, I think that, that civil service is a benefit to both the, the communities and the members that they serve. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ross. And, and yet your, your comparison to insurance for when you need it is, I think is an apt one when it comes to the appeals process to have an objective um, dispute resolution opportunity rather than one that uh, answers 
perhaps um, has some alliance to the the organization that you're um, questioning. Senator Brady, do you have do you have a thank you, Mr. Chair? I was thinking the same thing about the comparison. I used to be in the insurance business, and the bottom line is having protection on both ends. So, thank you for your testimony, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Brady. I don't see a uh, question from the commission, so I'm going to move to Kevin McNiff. I think I see you here, Kevin McNiff. Uh, I'd like to thank the commission for uh, hearing my testimony today. I'll try to make this quick. Uh, I think most of the issues that uh, seem to arrive with civil service start and end with uh, staffing and funding. I think a lot of the uh, other issues tend to resolve themselves with the fully staffed and fully funded civil service. Um, I believe fully staffing and uh, funding civil service will help with the exam cost. Uh, exams are far too expensive. Uh, you want to get more diverse, more bigger pools of candidates. Don't be limiting candidates because they can't afford to take the exam. $250 twice a year, uh, you know, doing police or fire. It's uh, it's limiting people from applying for these. Uh, same thing goes with, um, I believe this should be a local option for annual or biannual exams. Our community would be better off doing it biannually. We have, oh, sorry, uh, in Weymouth, we have a pretty big pool of candidates. It takes a while to hire someone from the exams. Uh, sometimes it's eight months, we have a vacancy. You know, you start doing exams once a year, they're gonna wait even longer. We might be having vacancies over a year, year and a half, trying to get the candidate we want. Uh, civil service provides checks and balances. We've had occasions where, um, sorry, we've had occasions where members have bypassed for entry exams. Uh, they've appealed through civil service. Civil service has ruled in their favor. If it wasn't for civil service, these members wouldn't be on the job now. Um, I believe it's also too easy to leave civil service. I think it should be more difficult for communities to leave civil service without the approval of the members of our departments. Uh, civil service is there to protect us. So I think we should have a bigger say on one community's leave. Um, and that's about it. If anyone has any questions, more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Chair Brady, do you have questions? I'm all set. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, also real quick, I know you had called on uh, Jimmy Young. He is yeah. uh, available now. He's a uh, member of uh, Wayman Firefighters Local 1616. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call on Dennis Mon and then Jim Young. If Dennis Mon is here. I think he I'm here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and Jim Young. Yep. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Chairman Brady, always good to see you. Uh, I'm going to be a little more personal in my remarks here because a lot's been said about funding and staffing and training. Um, I joined the Norwood Fire Department. I'm the Secretary of Local 1631. I got on the Norwood Fire Department in uh, 1999. I've held every union position except uh, treasurer. And that's part of my uh, history here. My first five years, I was basically deployed on Norwood Fire Department. I was deployed overseas to a couple different places. When I came back, I knew nothing about civil service. But I was, I was guaranteed and reassured time after time, you don't have to worry about anything. You're going back to your group. You're getting your seniority back, be it ambulance seniority, be it department seniority. And that's because we have a great collaboration here amongst the professional firefighters of Massachusetts. I know Tommy uh, Lyons was on this brief earlier, but the strong uniqueness of civil service and that Massachusetts requires a veterans agent in every town. That's very unique as a civil service. And we benefit from that greatly. So I didn't have to worry about anything. Then I got involved in the union. And I watched my brothers and sisters in blue in Norwood the last couple of years bargain themselves out of civil service. And I said, geez, they got paid a lot. And I became the guy that would say, if the price is right, everything's on the table. Well, uh, last September, our former chief retired after a three year tenure. This is a man who benefited from every aspect of civil service in the promotion process and the disciplinary process. He became the chief. He couldn't be more anti-union, anti, more anti-civil service. Now any of you, any of my brothers in the fire service know, I'm a pretty big uh, veterans advocate in my town, and I'm a pretty big uh, veterans uh, union advocate in my town. Sometimes my tongue runs a little quicker than my brain, which tends to piss a lot of people off. But being that, 
I've always stood up for the union. And having that chief who became instantly anti-labor, whether his grievances were perceived or true, I was glad to have civil service on my back. No, it is a big, small town. Um, I ran for office here. I lived all my life here. Not much gets by without me get back to me. So when you hear the threats that are coming by you, about you because of your activism, you can brush some of them off depending on who they're coming from. But when they're coming from the town manager or the board of selectmen's office or uh, the personnel office, some of those you really have to take a little seriously. And I thank God every day, like my brother Ross said earlier about insurance. I'm able to remain a union advocate over those last three years and wake up every day because I'm in the professional firefighters of Massachusetts and I have an independent arbitrator at civil service to back any perceived grievance the town has against me or any true grievance against me. Civil service is that great independence we all have that is not in place when towns uh, conduct disciplinary hearings. It is a tremendous benefit to our future. We've got never mind hiring and the veterans benefits, but when somebody's in trouble, whether in true trouble or not, it is great to wake up with the blanket of civil service over here. So thanks for all the work you guys are doing this whole committee. Senator Brady, always a pleasure seeing you and uh, good luck everybody. Thank you very much for your testimony, Dennis. I appreciate it. Senator Brady, Chair Brady, do you have questions? No, thank you for your testimony as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do see a hand up from a member of the public, but we're really, we're not taking questions uh, except for from commissioners. So if you have a question, you certainly can reach out to us uh, or to the subcommittee chairs and, and, uh, and ask them in that way. Uh, Jim Young, you've come back. Tim Young? Unmute. Sorry. Where'd you go? Oh, now. You, Thank you. I can um, hear you. At the, we can't see you, but we can. Oh, there you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you for taking me uh, out of turn. I'm, I'm at the station today responding to uh, calls. And I wanted to thank the commissioners, senators, reps, um, and my brothers and sisters from all organizations here. Um, my name is Jim Young. I am a firefighter. I've been a firefighter in Weymouth, Mass for 28 years. And I am what you would call a civil service success story. Um, I grew up in Dorchester. I'm a minority. I was hired in Weymouth off a minority list 28 years ago. 28 years ago, a fire chief by the name of Dave Madden, who eventually became the mayor, hired four, five, four residents, two women and two minorities. As far as I know, and I know that there's been a lot of talk about diversity and equity, I don't, is there anything that stops cities and towns now from doing the same thing that I was given the opportunity 28 years ago to do? Civil service changed my life, my family's life. It brought me into the middle class. So for 28 years, I've been a firefighter. For 25 of those, I proudly served in different positions in the union. Now, serving in those positions in the union, uh, I've you know, pretty outspoken. Um, and I, I'm very passionate about this job, about the people we represent. And I, over the years, I, I've been in trouble. <laughs> um, to put it lightly, um, civil service, the DLR, having those things in place protect labor advocates or any type of advocate um, from retribution from cities and towns. It's the only thing that's kept me on the job right now. I am now looking at the end of my career towards a retirement. Um, I would love to see a more diverse, I want our, our departments to more reflect uh, the communities we represent. I think it'd make it all better, whether it be police, fire, I, I don't know much, you know, I, I can speak from the fire department's aspect, but um, people are happy when they see a show up. And I think uh, as our communities become more diverse, we could do a better job. Now, now, how do we do that? I thought about it when I when I first got out of the Army. So I got on a list. I was in Boston. I grew up in Dorchester. I went to the Army. I came home. What am I going to do? Um, everybody told me, take the civil service list. I took the police test. I took the fire test. But at the time, it, it was hard to do. I was married, young, small family. I'm working three jobs. Um, so what do we do? So I wrote the check and I took the test. And thankfully, it worked out for me. I see now. The, the expense of these, these exams. And I've really given this a lot of thought about how, how do we make it more diverse? How do we make it better? I, I think 
I don't know if I, like I said, I haven't gone. So I don't know if anybody said about going to community colleges, maybe even going to um, high schools, going into the community and offering, I, I, you know, 50,000 free exams. I, I don't know. I don't know what we got to do to, to do it, but I know that back 28 years ago, it was tough. And I think the check was maybe a hundred, may, maybe even less than a hundred bucks when I took the exam. Uh, it was a, it was a tough decision for me, my wife and I to make like, all right, can I afford it this week? Well, you know, hopefully we get a, I get a job out of it. And thank God, I wish civil service was a person so I could thank them. Civil service has done an unbelievable job in my life and those like me. Civil service has protected people that have been, I've seen unjustly attacked. They're in the middle of being unjustly attacked. And one of the things I've always been able to do as a union leader is to be able to go in and thankfully count on senators and reps who, will, who listen. They always pick the phone up when we call and they're always there to listen, which I really appreciate. And I think civil services too. We're not looking for, you know, anybody to cut anybody any breaks. We just want it to be fair and equitable. And it's not that way anymore. Every time I turn around and the same association keeps coming up, and I'll, I'll say it again, uh, President McKinnon touched on it earlier, is they, they want to take people out of civil service to make them more diverse. But then when we ask these communities that have come out of civil service, show us your diversity, show us this plan. If this works, maybe we'll take it to our community. And no one has come to us and said, oh, yeah, this works. What we get is we get we get fines for people's sons getting hired. And then I also heard that, you know, after that, he's like, oh, yeah, I paid the fine. He still has the job. So I, I'm going to ask you to wrap up soon because you're well beyond the time. I oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I yield. Sorry. I, again, <laughs> this is kind of why I get in trouble. I, I, appreciate, I do appreciate your, your enthusiasm. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. I do. Thank you. Uh, Chair Brady, do you have any questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. I am going to Joshua Hetzler. Your name is still on the board. Are you here? You're the only witness whose name is up there, but you have not responded to the calls. Okay. You here? No. Okay. All right. Then we're going to move on. That's our, th those, that's everybody who signed up to testify who's here. And again, uh, if you're here, uh, we, uh, we are welcoming written testimony from our witnesses. The last thing on the um, agenda that we have is that we would like to schedule our next meeting. And what I'd like to do from here in is um, have a discussion of the subcommittee reports that um, uh, the, the four subcommittees. And for now, I see um, Representative Haddad is here and you're doing the one on the state police. Would you be prepared, say, in two or three weeks on a Friday? I have to look at a calendar to do our, so we could schedule our next meeting if, if, the, if the commission is, is uh, agreeable to doing this, and if, and if you would be ready to do it. So what, right now we're at, so that would be the, um, uh, call either the 11th, oh, I, um, no, yeah, uh, the 11th, Perhaps. Um, I should be ready. I'm I'm trying to schedule one more meeting with my um, group, but we should have plenty of time to do that. Okay. Okay. Do that, okay. Um, Paul, um, let me see. Paul Medeiros, I thought I called on you. I thought you've testified. No. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead, Paul. Oh, so so the eleventh we'll do the subcommittee on the state police. And I don't know that there's anyone else who is a subcommittee chair that's here right now. Uh, so then I'll, we'll reach out and maybe we'll do so that we can do the two hours, maybe one hour and one hour. Is that okay, Rep. Okay. Okay. Chair sure, Gordon, I, I happen to know that uh, Representative Higgins has a meeting scheduled for Friday, February 18th at 10 a.m. But that's for the subcommittee. Right, right. This is for the... Um, this would be the, the full commission, the 11th, anybody who can attend, hopefully we all can, at 10 a.m. to hear the, the uh, state police report. Now, Paul Medeiros, you can unmute if you have, I thought you testified, I, I, I had marked you Thank off. you, no, no, I appreciate the opportunity. Right, Unfortunately, my mistake. I had to I thought you just had a attend. question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, 
I know I was on the list. I had a Mass Fire Academy graduation to attend here at the Bridgewater campus. And I came back and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I was here for the beginning and I didn't have an opportunity. I appreciate you letting me um, speak. Uh, to the committee, I thank you for all your uh, hard work and diligence regarding this. I just had a couple things regarding, uh, I'm a Hyannis Fire Lieutenant. I've been there for 30 years. Um, I understand civil service. I'm actually a laid off firefighter from Norton Fire 30 years ago. And I was um, given those opportunities to get picked up at other places. And it didn't work out for those other civil service departments. And I ended up in Hyannis. Uh, here it is 30 years later. So I understand um, civil service and how it works. Um, and I also, as a department, I'm also the district vice president in the eighth district that represents uh, 42 communities on the Cape and the South Coast. Um, and I have a diversity of um, locals that I represent, both big and small, and uh, hiring, promotion, and uh, discharge and discipline are like big things. And civil service takes care of us for those things. But one thing I wanna to bring to light, the two plus one, as far as for promotion, that seems to be the lay of the land. And I don't know that making that number bigger to uh, promote people for whether it's Lieutenant Captain, District Chief, Deputy Chief, or Chief for that matter, expanding that field to five or seven people. I know it's very challenging to get people um, to fill out the list. So it, it, it either um, keeps those people in or within the department or expanding it outside. And we want this to be fair and equitable and adding or changing those numbers, I think can make it more difficult. And then you have more influence from the outside relative to who those people are. It's challenging and tough enough to get promoted and do well on a test. And it's usually the top three candidates. If there's one position, that person gets promoted. And if not, there's appeal and there's processes there. And for those departments that don't, it gets all um, intertwined. And I know other people spoke about that before. And we want to be fair and equitable to those members. And if you do that for the chief's job, I know that that's even more challenging in expanding the field that you're going to have, what, 10 top candidates and picking from those. I don't know that the people that are making those choices based on that list will be able to ever come up with the top person. And I thought that's what civil service testing is for, is to make it fair and equitable. This is the situation that you have. These are the rules to follow. They haven't been changed. So I know that if I want to aspire to be a chief or a deputy or a fire lieutenant, that this is the steps that I need to take so I can move forward and go through that process. And there's appeals if there's things, whether it's through the grievance or through civil service. So um, those are the things that I just wanted to raise relative to that. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you to the committee for letting me uh, come back in and, and do this. And I applaud your work and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for coming back in and, and testifying. Um, okay, I think those are the witnesses on the list. I think everyone's had a chance to testify. Uh, if you haven't, just go off mute now and tell us because I, I don't think we overlooked anybody else. Um, and I think that's the business that the commission has of the day. So uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Oh, yes, and a second. 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 Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your attendance. Uh, Jim, you, send, you can send written testimony to send it to uh, here. I'm going to answer this in the chat. Uh, I'm going to send everybody a written testimony. I am going to get so Elizabeth. Uh, should I send it to, um, Liz, to Lizzie Donovan? Mr. Chairman, uh, Jesse Foley, I can put the, uh, yeah, I can put the email in the chat right okay. now. Okay, Cody is going to put in the chat. I Where believe there's also some information on the uh, legislature's website about this special commission, and maybe that would be an appropriate place to um, include information on the, uh, the website. Yeah, let's make sure that's there. Cody will follow up, or someone from the staff will follow up. Okay, there it is. Cody's put Je uh, Jesse Foley's uh, by electronically it is the probably the quickest way to do it. So email us because um, with COVID, um, the 
the mail is, is going to be slow getting into the state house and and then and there's some inefficiency so email is the quickest way okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to leave this open for about 10 more minutes so that if anybody wants to um look through the chat and take down that email address i won't be in a hurry to close it all okay our meeting is, is adjourned so anybody can leave but this way you've got uh jesse's email address up there okay thank you mr chairman everybody be safe have a good okay. weekend thank you everybody thank you thank you all Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.